Let's pray and we'll get started. God, thank you so much for this night. God, we thank you uh, just for the faithfulness of other churches. We thank you for First Baptist Church. We thank you for South Hill Baptist Church, um, God, that allowed this zany group <laughs> to invade them. And God, they've been very gracious. And we thank you for them. God, I pray that you bless both those congregations immensely. So proud and so happy to hear how uh, First Baptist is growing and doing great things in the community. And um, God, I pray that South Hill will do the same. I pray you'd give them um, just great guidance, Father. Lead them where you want them to go. I pray for Paul and Julie and Calvin, that whole team, Father. I pray that you'd bless them, help them to know how much they mean to us. God, help us to leave with grace and dignity and help us to bless them and help them to um, know, just know how much we love them. God, we thank you for tonight. God, I pray that you would give me the words. Holy Spirit, um, I am nothing without you. I'm very aware of that. So God, speak through me. Use me more of you and less of me, Jesus. Help me to unwrap this passage of Scripture and make you proud of the words that are spoken. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, we are in the, at the end. This is supposed to be the end of our words series. And uh, the last few weeks, I've been reading, just reading my Bible. Hopefully, I read my Bible. That's a good thing, right? And, uh, and just, I've been reading in Joshua, and I've, I've been in the same passage of Scripture for the last few weeks. I often stop and I camp out on a, on a passage of Scripture. I'm not really a big Bible in a year guy. I'm kind of like a Bible in a century guy, probably. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I get stuck on a certain passage of Scripture, and I, it just starts speaking to my spirit, speaking to my soul, and, and I really, really enjoyed this passage of Scripture. It's been so amazing to me. And so um, as I was praying, and, and, and God really made it clear to me that, that there's a message here that I need to speak uh, to this group, to us at this time in our journey. And um, so uh, we're not going to finish the words series. Uh, it was supposed to be on encouragement versus discouraging words tonight. So be encouraged. Jesus loves you. Yeah. All right. That's about all you're going to get on that. Um, this story is found at the end of Moses' life. So Moses is, he's like the, uh, he's like the Michael Jordan of Israel. Right, he he's like the champion. He's like whenever Israelites, whenever Jews talk about Moses, it's just like this. Oh, Moses! Moses is the guy. All right, and so Moses has passed away, and now he's passed his torch on to Joshua. And now what's going to happen is Joshua's going to go into Jericho, right? We talked about that a little bit a couple weeks ago. They're going to march around a wall seven times. Right? Remember that? I talked about it. I'm like, okay, you can play along with me here. All right. So they walk around the wall seven years, and then the walls fall inward on Jericho. Did you know that? The walls fall in, not out. Isn't that cool? How normally when some stuff falls, it falls out. It falls in. And so Israelites go in there, and it's just an easy battle, right? So, so there's that story. There's the Moses story. Right in between there, there's a story in Joshua 3, 4, and even 5. That is a really, really cool story. So turn your Bibles to Joshua chapter 3. Today's message is called Crossing the Jordan. Crossing over the Jordan. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. It's, uh, I think, six books into your Bible. If you're new to your Bible from left to right. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. You guys ready? Yeah. All right. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Akaisha Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they, where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, since you've never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about a half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. 
Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. Isn't that a great start to the story? Are you guys anxious to see what's going to happen? So am I. So point number one, if you're taking notes this evening, I highly suggest it. I always learn more when I take notes. Point number one is a new direction requires a new guide. Now, I am pretty sure that most everyone in here has made a decision to follow Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Maybe not everyone, but I think a vast majority. So you might be saying, well, uh, I don't need a new guide. Jesus is my guide. I even sang the song, Jesus, take the wheel and everything. <laughs> Jesus is my guy. He's my guide. Well, I would argue that I would be willing to bet that everyone in this room has an area that you can think of pretty quickly that you still need to give over to Jesus. I thought of three or four really quickly when I was reading this the first several times I read it. There's at least one area of your life. I, I find that oftentimes we will try and try and try in our own power, and then we'll try again, and we'll try again, and try again, till finally we give something over to God. Now, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but there's a couple that got married, right? There's a couple that got married, right? And so they're going someplace that they've never been before. That couple is right here. If you look up on the screen, this is that couple right here. There's a couple, yeah. no, Selena's not here, because she'd kill me if she saw me put this picture up there. Bangs are high, baby, for all you ladies from back in the 90s. Got to put the bangs up there. Yeah. I don't know what I was doing, just ooh, got the stash. Anyway, um, so there's this couple right here that they're going someplace that they've never, ever been before. They're, look at them. They're so stupid. I mean, look at that. Look at that. Just ignorant. They don't know what they're getting into. Am I right? They're like, hey, you wait till life punches you right in the face. Right? They're going someplace that they've never been to. Now, I would love to say I would love to stand up here and say that this couple did it like Kristen Alex did it, that they had the Lord at the center of their marriage. I would love to say that they, that they had communion on their wedding day. I would love to say that they, they kept themselves pure from one another until their wedding day. I would love to say that about this couple here, but I can't say that about this couple here. As a matter of fact, I will tell you this about this couple here. Is this couple here did it on their own for quite a few years. This couple here did it on their own for about eight years of their lives. Eight years. And finally, the one on the right, the one with a silly mustache, had an epiphany. He had a conversation with God. And he had a conversation with God where, where he asked God, he said, Hey, God, when, are, when God, I've been praying for this woman. You know I've been praying for her. When, God, when are you going to change her? How long must I suffer? When, God, when are you going to fix her? And you guys have probably heard this before. I've told you a story before, but it's such a great, great illustration. I've never heard God talk to me. God has never done the chore. I wish he would, but he doesn't. But I felt... God speaking so strongly in my spirit, saying, Troy, turn her in to what? Into the woman of God that you think she should be because you're such an expert on women of God. And God, just one of those holy spankings, if you will, God said, Troy, you focus on being a man of God and you let me help her to be the woman of God that I'm calling her to be, not who you think she should be. And from that moment, it wasn't instantaneous. I still made some mistakes. But that's when I said, you know what, God? You're going to lead my marriage. Amen. You're going to be the leader. I'm going to follow you. And then I'll allow Lena to follow me as I follow you. Yeah, 
And then, God, you're going to do the work. And God, you know what? I'm going to love her. I'm going to cherish her simply because I'm a man of God, and that's what men of God do. I have no expectations of her. That's your job. Amen. See, a new direction requires a new guide. At the wedding, I uh, did it. Such a great job. I walked my daughter down the aisle. I told her a funny joke when she was stressing out. Right when we getting ready to walk down the aisle, I said something funny to her, and she started laughing, just took out all. I was just like, yes, I'm a champ. <laughs> Handling this well. Didn't cry. I did not shed nay a tear. I promise you. Until the dance. <laughs> until the dance. And... My daughter said these words to me that I will never forget. She said, Dad, you are the greatest man I've ever known. And I couldn't talk. I just kept kissing her head like a weirdo. I was like, <laughs> that's all I could do. About probably a year and a half ago, my, by the way, my daughter Rachel and her boyfriend Mario were here. Don't, don't clap too much. You're leaving in two days. Bums. Anyway, just kidding. Uh, pray for them, by the way, please. If you remember, please pray for them as they're flying and on their journey and they're in Australia and they're doing some really cool things and they're really learning and growing a lot. Very proud of both of them. Anyway, my daughter Rachel sends me this text out of nowhere and it says something like this. It said, Dad, I just want to tell you that I'm so proud of you. I love you and you lead our family so well. And I want to thank you for that. And I just want to let you know that I notice it. I may not always show it, but I notice it. Something I'll never, ever forget. My son, Troy, told me not too long ago, he said, Dad, you've changed so much. You've changed so much into who you are today. And I just want to be like you when I grow up, when I get to be your age. And as I was thinking this week, and uh, by the way, painting is very, very good time to think. <laughs> I mean, if you've got good stuff going on in your life, painting is awesome. If you're having a bad time in life, painting probably stinks. Because <laughs> I'm having a really good time in my life, so I'm painting away going, oh, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, I'm thinking about stuff, but if you're not, anyway. So, <laughs> sidebar. Um, and so I'm thinking about this, and I start just really, really humbling myself before God and thanking him for taking over my life. I say to myself, man, what would I be? What would those conversations sound like with my children? My wife sent me this beautiful birthday message on Facebook that was just amazing. And I thought to myself, what would have happened if I would have never, ever let you be the leader of my family and the leader of my life and leader of my marriage, what would have happened? What would those words be like? Would that dance be awkward? Would my daughters even want to talk to me? Would me and my wife even be married today? Listen, change is hard. Where we're going and what we're doing as a church is going to be difficult. But listen, in your life and us as a church, if we continue to allow God to be, I'm not the leader of this church. God is the leader of this church. I tell you guys that over and over again. All I'm doing is doing my best to follow him. And if we allow him to lead and we follow his lead and we, and we do the things he's calling us to do, we will continue to be a great force in this community. If we don't, we will fail miserably. It's that simple. In your life, in your marriage, in your finances, in your parenting, in your job, anything, you fill in the blank. If you allow God to lead it, it will be great. If you don't, it will suffer. Amen. Joshua chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift up the ark of the covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make, a great leader, make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I am with Moses. Another version of this says, you will be exalted. Joshua, I am going to exalt you. 
in the eyes of people. When I read that, I'm like, would that be awesome? <laughs> Troy, I'm going to exalt you. <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> yeah, right? Point number two in your notes is this. God's elevation is always for his revelation. God's elevation is always for his revelation. Remember this. Before Joshua was exalted, before Israel was exalted in the eyes of other nations, they wandered aimlessly in the desert for 40 years. That's like I would have been wandering when I was 12 till now. It's turned 52, yeah, right? 12. When I was 12 years old, I was playing Little League. 40 years they wandered aimlessly. They just went around in a circle. Did you know that? They, just went, they didn't go anywhere. They just went around in a circle, round and round, and they had to follow this pillar. Fire by day, pillar, or pillar by day, fire by night. It's time to go. All right, where are we going? Oh, just follow the pillar. And they just went around and around and around for 40 days. Why? Because of their disobedience. See, when God elevates you, when God gives you a gift or a talent, when God gives you a position, when God gives you something, when God blesses you with a building, okay, when God has a great church, okay, it's always been a great church from the very beginning. We just now have our own building, okay? The church and the building, we got to separate that. When God gives you a building, it's not so we can say, look at us, aren't we cool? No, no, no. God gives us a building so that we can bring him glory, so we can magnify his name, so we can make his name famous, so we can find people, we can allow people to come in and feel comfortable. People who are far away from Jesus, people who don't know him, they can come to know him. Listen, people, there are thousands and thousands of people around here every day that are suffering and they're just wallowing in their in their uh, just grossness of their lives and they're depressed and they're anxious and they're sad and they don't have what you have. They don't have the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. And they're, they don't know why they're unhappy. They can't explain why they're unhappy. So they go to their doctor and they say, here, take a couple of these. It'll make you all better. No, it doesn't. It just numbs you. What they're missing is they're missing Jesus and they're missing the Holy Spirit. We have a job to do. God has blessed us with this building. So God's saying, okay, I'm going to give you this, but you better do good things with it. God has given you talents. God has given you gifts. That's not so you can say, oh, look at me. Look how great I am. No, that's to bring him Glory. Let me ask you a question. Is God seen through the blessings in your life? Everything you have that's good is of God and from God. Okay? It is a blessing from God. Is God seen through the blessings in your life? Is he seen, can, they, can he be seen through the blessings in your life? I asked myself that question this week, and man, did it bring me to my knees. You might say, well, man, I got to, God's really blessed me financially. Okay, how are you blessing him with that? How is your generosity to other people showing him? People say, man, why would you do this? I, I wouldn't in my own <laughs> doing. It's not me. It's God in me. Because I'm not all that generous, but he has been good to me, so I'm going to be good to you. What about, do you have a talent? Do you have a gift that you're not using to bring him glory? Is there something that you have that you're just using or you're just putting on the shelf? You're saying, yeah, I really should do that, but I just don't want to. Is God being blessed through your blessings? Is God being glorified through your blessings? Joshua chapter 3. Verse 8. I'm going to read a little bit more than what's on the screen. Uh, Tasha and your crew, just to let you know, I'm going to keep going and reading through this because there's more here I want to cover. So uh, Joshua 3 8 says this Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. Scott, come up here for a minute. Mark, stand up for a minute. Come here, Jim. Stand up for just a second. So you stand there. I'm standing there. You up here, Jim. You go over there next to Scott this way. You're right here next to me like this. This way, stand. Okay, go like this. Okay. We have a 
pound, if we're Levi priests, by the way, if we're not, we would drop dead. Anyway, um, we have a 1,200 pound golden ark. You guys saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? That thing. <laughs> we're we're going to read in just a moment where the banks are. This is during the flood season, it says. So the Jordan, the Jordan River during the summertime, like right now, you can walk through the Jordan River and don't even get your knees wet. But during flood season, it's bad business. It's like coming through, right? So, so we're going into this body of water, this rushing water, right? So what do you want to do? You want to be as light as possible, right? So we're going to the water over there, the rushing river. Ready, guys? With a 1,200-pound object on your shoulders. That's not going to go well. Go, well. <laughs> go ahead and have a seat. Good job, fellas. Let's read on. Just a, oh, that's right. It's not going to be up there. Okay, I'm going to read on. It says, so the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests, check this out, who were carrying the ark, touched the water, so those guys, the, water's rivers, the river's edge, the water above the, that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Isn't that cool? Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Point number three, if you're taking notes, obedience to God doesn't always make sense. There's going to be times in your life where God is going to call you and ask you to do things that don't make any sense. Let's just say you're a, a guy who is in the trucking industry. I don't know, just throw it out there. You do trucking. It's what you do. That's just what your life is. And you've got a plan. Let's just say you got a 20-year plan. And someday you want to be a teacher of junior high kids. Right? Who would be crazy enough to be a trucker in the, yeah, yeah right? And, and you can have a great plan. And God might say, hey, I want you to be a youth pastor. F what? That's crazy. And then years later, he might have you, I don't know, leading a church called Cornerstone Community Church. Who knows? I don't know. God's going to tell you to do things in your life. He's going to ask you to obey. And he's going to say things that don't always make sense. And then there's times where, because, you know, now I can look back and I can say, oh, yeah, I see everything. That's cool. I saw how God did all of that. And I say, that's really cool. God, thank you. You're so awesome. But then there's times where you may not even know what God is doing and you may never figure it out. Because it may not always, hold on to your seats, be about you. <laughs> yeah. So this last week, the last two weeks, it's my prayer time. God has been been just putting on my heart to do something. God's been, been putting on my heart to reach out to somebody. And, and, and he's just been putting it really heavy on my heart. And I'm just like, I don't want to. And God said, no, I, you're going to. And I go, no. And he goes, no, you're going to. And I just felt so strong. I'm like, okay, God, this is what you're calling me to do. So I did it. And it turned out terribly. It could have turned out anywhere. I could have I could have painted an ending being bad other than me dying. It couldn't have been any worse. And I'm just like, what was that? I mean, I've been a Christian for a while. I know when you're telling me to do stuff, I did something. And, when, and you know what? I have to constantly say this prayer. It's scriptural. You can, if you get this down, you don't hear anything else, hear this tonight. I have to constantly do this because of me. It's, it's, his ways are higher than my ways. God's ways are higher than my ways. God is outside of time. God sees the whole picture. And it's not always about me, and it's not always about you. It's not always about us. It's about him and his plan and us just 
being obedient to that plan. And it doesn't always make sense, but you know what? God's ways are higher than your ways. God is smarter than you are. Listen, God, everyone talks about this word progressive. Have you ever heard that? Oh, you're a, I'm a progressive. Have you ever heard that? Oh, yeah, we're progressives. It's a big term now. Oh, we're progressives. Oh, we're, we're so much smarter. Listen, God's not progressive. God doesn't get any smarter. God cannot get any smarter. God can't go to Harvard and learn a thing. God is, is above all. He sees all. He knows all. And there's times where he's going to call you out of your comfort zone. He's going to have you do stuff. And it's going to be really, really weird. And it's not going to make any sense. But God's going to say, just trust me. Just trust me. Just trust me. And when we do that, and when we follow that call, man, great things happen. This is something that... Um, I came up with later on as I was reading this. It's kind of a sub point to this point is um, why was the ark, do you think, put out so far ahead? Well, all this time the ark was among the people and, and, and Joshua says put the ark way out ahead and don't get too close to it. And I think, I don't know this and I just, I've been praying a lot about it and this is just what I think. This isn't anything that, that is biblically um, proven. I think it's so that God is out in front and no longer just a part. He's leading. He, he's out in front. And, and you know, if you put something, if you, if you have something, in, like if you have a whole bunch of people and you put something like in the middle, not everyone can really see it, right? But when something is far off in a distance, everyone can see it, right? And I thought about this. Is God leading your journey or is he just a part of your luggage? Is God leading your family? Is God leading your life? Is God leading your journey or is he just something, just part of your journey? God wants to be the center of all you do. God wants every thought that you make have to do with him. Did you know that? God wants every decision you make to be have him in mind. God wants to be the leader of your life. He wants to be your Lord and Savior, not just your Savior. He wants to be the Lord of your life. And there's too many times in our lives where God just becomes kind of part of what we're doing. He's just, he's just in the mix. Rather than being exalted and put out in front where he belongs... Right? Are you guys, do you, do you guys follow this? Am I making sense? Instead of being out in front where he belongs, he's just kind of part of, of what I do. He's just part of the routine. And that's not good enough. <laughs> that's not good enough. God is either everything or he's nothing. God is either the leader of your life or he's not. And that means every area. And church, I'm here to tell you that this is a convicting message for me. Hopefully it is for you too because we all got work to do, Yes. And we have to allow God to be the leader and be out in front of our lives. Not just part of our luggage, not just something that we carry around, not just another sofa table, but, but he's the leader. He is the reason why we live and why we exist. Right. Joshua chapter 4, verse 1, moving forward. It says, when all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take the 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan, carry them out, and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one, from each one of each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on your shoulder. What's that mean? It's heavy. Twelve stones in all, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial in the future. Your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord, Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. That's kind of silly, huh? No, seriously. I mean, if, if, you, if you're standing there and you're watching, right, 
Cricket, cricket. The water just stopped. See, we read the Bible already knowing the end of the story too much. So we're just like, oh, yeah, the water stopped. No, no, no. The water stopped. It's not like there's a spigot. Well, Jesus had his hand on a spigot, right? Put the foot in the water and the water stopped. And then this part kept going and this part stopped. And it says the riverbed, oh, it was a little bit muddy and slushy. No, no, no. Know what it said? It said it was dry. They're not going to forget that. Will they? <laughs> Next point in your notes. We must never forget God's faithfulness. Those silly Israelites, you know, aren't you glad we're not like them? I mean, God does something great in our life. You know, when we're sitting there and we're just like, oh, God. Oh, God, please, 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 please. Help me to get a new car. I'm not going to be able to get to work if I don't have a car. God, please get the financing to go through. God, please, 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 please. Right? Am I the only one who ever prays prayers like that? Come on. Right? You know, the, the nose snotty, eyes crying prayers. You know what I'm talking about. And then three days later, you're cruising. You're like, God, you're so awesome. Oh my gosh, God, I should have never got approved for any kind of financing. I've got a car. God, you're so wonderful. I'm going to put it on 105.3. Yeah. Oh, I'll never, all my precepts, 105.3, 105.3, 105.3. I'm not, that's all. Oh, God, you're so awesome. You're so great. And two weeks later, Oh, how come this car doesn't have air conditioning? It's hot. Aren't you glad we're not like the Israelites? We never forget God's good faithfulness in our lives. Listen, I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you. Journal, put up sticky notes, uh, have a special room where you write stuff on the wall, whatever, <laughs> Sheila. Yeah. Do whatever you have to do. Tell your kids, remind your kids, tell your story. Your kids should be like this. When you're telling them stories about God's faithfulness, they should be like this. I know, Dad, and then God got you the car, and you should have never got it. Yeah, 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 we already know. We've heard it a thousand times. That's what your kids should be saying. So when they're older, and they're going through it, and they're having a hard time in their lives, they're going to say, what am I going to do? Oh, wait a minute. What did Dad, oh, I remember the story about the car. Pray, 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 pray. Don't forget God's faithfulness. Don't forget God was good to my dad. He'll be good to me. God is good to me here. He'll be good to me again. God has done great things. Just take count of all the things that God has done in your life. If, if you had a dollar for every prayer that God answered in your life, there'd be some rich folks in here, right? But we just get, we're so caught up in the moment that we forget what God has done in our lives. Don't ever forget God's faithfulness. As we were, we were moving into this new building, man, I'll tell you what, it's so exciting. Yeah. And it is so cool. And we're going to be in there. It's going to be awesome. Woo. We're going to have new people coming. We're going to be able to greet them. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. And it's going to, it is going to be spectacular right. Right. for about three months. Yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> I would love to stand up here and tell you that I'm wrong, but I'm right. Pretty soon, it's going to be a building. Pretty soon, oh, yeah, yeah. Someone's going to come in and go, whoa, you guys got cool lights, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, they are cool. Yeah, uh -huh. That's what it's going to be. We have to remember God's faithfulness. Remember all the doors, all the terrible decisions that we, if we had our way with buildings in the past, holy guacamole, God saved us for some really, really bad decisions. Because you know what? We prayed open doors, closed doors, and God went shaboom, 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 and closed door after door after door. And we said, okay, that's what God wants. We'll just keep doing what we're doing, right? So God has given us this. He's blessed us with this. But if we're not careful, we'll soon, very quickly, forget God's blessing. 
It's important that we remember this is a gift from God. We have done nothing to deserve this. God has had everything to do with this. But I was praying this week. Once again, I was painting this week, painting and praying. And uh, God reminded me of a conversation I had with him in the parking lot of Key Bank before we started Cornerstone Community Church. And I... We were moving along, and we were trying to find a place to meet, and, and we decided, that Lena and I, that, hey, this is a decision we're making, and, and the job opportunities were no longer there. So I'm like, I'm all in now at this point, and, and I'm just sitting there, and just all these calls are coming in, and I'm talking to people, and stuff's going on, and I just felt overwhelmed, and I just pulled over, and I just stopped, and I just sat there, and I just cried my face off cried and I prayed and I cried and I prayed. I said, God, I have no idea what I'm doing. No idea what I'm doing. And I would just remember the timely phone call of a good friend of mine who said, listen, if one person comes to Jesus while you're a pastor, it'll be worth it. And I said, yeah, I think I can get one. All right. <laughs> And I remember that conversation, and I remember that as I was painting, I'm saying, God, you are so good to us. God is so good to us, guys. He's been so faithful. Three years. We got a building in three years. That's just unheard of. And God is so faithful. He's so good. Why? Because he's leading our church. He's leading and we're following. Don't ever, ever, ever forget that. Last part, part Joshua 4, 24, one verse says, he did this so all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful and you might fear the Lord your God forever. You might fear the Lord your God for fear the Lord. Fear, fear, fear? Afraid of the Lord. Fear the Lord. Hmm. Last point, Joshua said it, we must always fear the Lord. Now, this isn't very popular these days, is it? I mean, we're not supposed to fear God because God loves us. Jesus loves us. Right? He's so sweet, and cuddly, and lovey. God loves us. We don't have to fear him. We're not supposed to fear God, right? Let me ask you this. Why did you obey your parents when you were younger? Because you were afraid to get a... Spanking. Hmm. Why did you do that job when you didn't want to do it? Your boss told you to do it. Why? Because you were afraid to get fired. Hmm. Why did you not run in the middle of the freeway when there's traffic going by? Because you're uh, afraid to get hit. ran over, hit, right? Hmm. Why don't you just swim into the ocean and keep on swimming? It'd be fun, nice little dip. Just keep swimming in the ocean when the tide's coming in and going crazy and rip ties. Why? Because you're uh, afraid that you will drown. Oh. Why don't you pick up the hot plate? You know, the server comes and says, don't touch, it's hot. Because you're afraid to get burnt, even though you always go, t -t -t -t. Right? <laughs> you tell them the truth. <laughs> why don't you do this? Well, because I'm afraid to... Well, why don't you? Well, because I'm afraid to. Listen, it's good to be afraid. Of smart to be afraid, right? Yeah. I'm not going to run into a lion's cage because I'm smart and I'm afraid of the lion. And you're smart to be afraid of the lion. Listen, I obey the Lord. I just be real because I love him because he is who he is, and I just want to serve him, and I want him to be proud of me. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant someday. But you know what? I also, I'm, I fear consequences because, you see, God created the universe, created the animals, created, every, created, created and he created me, so he probably pretty much knows what he's talking about. 
right? And so if God says you should live your life this way and do these things and not do these things, he probably knows what he's talking about. And then when we don't, he smites us and hits us with a lightning. No, he just says, okay, (laughs) you got free will. Do what you want. But don't come crying to me when there's consequences. But we do it. We make stupid choice after stupid choice after stupid choice after stupid choice, and we end up in a situation where we're like, God, why are you doing this to me? And God's like, I'm not doing anything. I told you. Fear of the Lord is good. And, and it's important that as we move and as we grow is that we have that message that, listen, there's an awe and a fear of God. There's a reverence. There's a, a holiness of God. We... Forgive me if you wore this T-shirt, but God is not your homeboy, okay? Jesus is not your homeboy. Jesus is your Lord. He's your Savior. He's your King. He's majestic. He is set apart. He is holy. There's none like him, and there needs to be a reverence and a fear of him because he is God and we are not. Anybody ever... Wish you were, you ever pray for humility? Anybody besides me? Just, man, you know, I would really, just, man, I need humility. Don't pray that way. Seek after God and learn more about him and about his character, and it will humble you. When you exalt God to the place of his rightful place, you will automatically be humbled in his presence. I'm going to finish with this. God has given us a great building, but we've got an even greater church. God's given us a great building, but we've got even a greater church. We have a responsibility to bring people who are far away from God closer to him. We, are, we have a vision to reach out to the unchurched, people who don't know him, and lead them closer to him. Last night at our prayer time, we had our P3 last night, and one of our elders was there, and and um, she was praying, and she started praying for the community, and she broke out into into tears as she was praying, and it was it was really touching to me, and it really snapped my mind back because my mind has been on. This needs to get done. That needs to get done. This needs to get done. This, needs to get done. this and this and this and this and all these things that need to get done. And I've been so preoccupied. It's been really hard to remember that there are people. Listen, I'm almost done. There are people who are far away from God, who don't know him, who are going to hell. I know it's not real popular to say these days either, but it's biblical. There are people who are far away from God who are going to hell. And we need to let them know that there is a God and he is madly in love with them. We have a great mission and we will not stop. We will not stop until he calls us home. Amen. God, we love you and we praise you. We worship you. We thank you, Father, for this night. We thank you, Lord, that um, you give us such great stories and great models in your word. We thank you, Father, that We thank you, God, that you're still, to this day, you're still a miracle worker. You don't stop. You're still in the business of doing the miraculous. God, I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in people around me. And so, Father, I pray that when we read your word, Father, that we will allow your word to shape us Allow your word to mold us. Allow your word to change us. God, I pray we'd never get tired, never get bored of reading your word. Jesus, may we never ever get tired of worshiping you for the sacrifice that you made for us on that cross. Jesus, you're all-powerful. You had all authority given to you, yet you stayed up on the cross. You allowed the beatings. You allowed the spit in the face. You allowed the slap in the face. You allowed a crown of thorns stuck into your head. 
You allowed nails in your hands. You allowed a spear in your side. Not because you had to, but because you wanted to. Because of the love that you have for each one of us. Every person in this room. God, let us not be selfish and keep that blessing to ourselves. Help us to tell everyone we know about the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. In your holy, perfect name we pray. Amen.